وكلمة الله هي العليا والله عزيز حكيم. The Ascendant Quran, realigning man to the divine power culture. The first ever tafsir written directly in English by one of the best Quran scholars in North America, Imam Muhammad al -Asi. Ten volumes of this multi-volume tafsir are now available from Crescent International at a special price of $40 per volume, including shipping anywhere in North America. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Zafar Bangash. Welcome to Muslim Perspectives. In this episode of Muslim Perspectives, we are going to focus on developments in Saudi Arabia. There have been a wave of arrests in the opaque kingdom and while this is nothing unusual for that uh, primitive kingdom, what is unusual this time is that this news has traveled far and wide because of social media, Twitter and so on. But we need to consider why these arrests have occurred at this time when in fact there are more than 40,000 political prisoners in Saudi Arabia already. Uh, most of those people, of course, were academics, lawyers, etc. But this time, the wave of arrests include clerics that were previously aligned with the Saudi regime, as well as a prince, Prince Abdulaziz ibn Fahad, who was the favorite son of King Fahad before, of course, he passed away. Now, we need to consider why these arrests are taking place and what is going on inside uh, Saudi Arabia. For most Muslims, uh, Saudi Arabia is uh, best known for the two holy cities of Mecca and al Madina. That is, of course, how it should be. Mecca houses the Kaaba, the first house of Allah on earth, and the place to which uh, Muslims face while they offer their five times daily Salat. Mecca is also the place where Muslims go to perform Hajj. And of course, they go out of Mecca to Mina, Arafat, Muzdalifa, and then back to Mina, etc. Medina is the city of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That is where he established the first Islamic State. And that is also the place where the noble messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is buried. And his burial place is marked by the green dome that is placed right on top of his burial place. Now, naturally, Muslims have a great reverence and respect for Mecca and al Madina, but it would be wrong to transfer that respect and reverence to the ruling family. After all, Mecca and Medina have existed for more than 1450 years. Mecca, in fact, much earlier than that as a sacred city, which is, in fact, was where, when the Kaaba was built by the two prophets, Ibrahim and Ismail, alayhim salam. So the history of Mecca and al Madina uh, stretches thousands of years, and that predates uh, the arrival of the Bani Saud in control of the Arabian Peninsula. That aside, we need to consider what is really going on in this kingdom. Now, the real problems of uh, Saudi Arabia started when Salman became the king in January of 2015 upon the death of King Abdullah. Now, there, are, there were, of course, a number of other deaths uh, in the family, uh, the reason being that uh, Abdulaziz ibn Saud, the founder of uh, Saudi Arabia, had, had married 23 women and he had produce something like 45 or 46 children, of which about 35 sons survived. Now, some of those sons are still alive, and the manner in which succession in Saudi Arabia takes place is that, of course, after Abdulaziz ibn Saud, his uh, eldest son, uh, Muhammad ibn Saud, took over, and then, according to their tradition, the next son in line, in line would take over. So, in fact, the uh, kingship passed from brother to brother. But now, Saudi Arabia has arrived at a point whereby a number of sons of Abdulaziz ibn Saud are still alive, but King Salman wants to transfer power to his own son, Muhammad bin Salman. Now, Muhammad bin Salman is 
a young person, uh, he's perhaps about 32, 33 years of age, quite inexperienced, he's very erratic, he's quite irrational, he in fact doesn't know much about what is going on either in the kingdom or around him, but he is uh, very, very uh, tempestuous and erratic in making decisions. We will look into some of the decisions that he has taken and that has brought nothing but grief to the kingdom. Let us start off with some of uh, Muhammad bin Salman's foreign adventures. Now Saudi Arabia had been involved in the turmoil in Syria since the, the uh, troubles started over there in 2011. There is ample proof, in fact, even from uh, WikiLeaks and State Department documents and statements by uh, Hillary Clinton, the former U.S. Secretary of State, indicating that the Saudis and the Qataris were behind the trouble in uh, Syria. Uh, the Saudis have, in fact, unleashed thousands of Takfiri terrorists in Syria, but after more than six years of bloodletting, uh, the war in Syria or the war on Syria is in fact winding down. And the reason for that is that the Syrian government of Bashar al-Assad, backed by its allies, uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran and uh, the Lebanese resistance movement, Hezbollah, as well as Russia, have in fact turned the tide in Syria. So as we speak today, the Syrian government is now in control of more than 80% of its territory. And all of these Saudi and Qatari and uh, Turkish and American and Israeli backed terrorists have been holed up in a small area and they are in fact on the run even from there. The Saudis faced equal failure in Iraq where they had unleashed these people and in fact the Iraqi army starting in October of 2016 drove the terrorists uh, first out of eastern parts of Mosul where the terrorists had established their so-called Khilafah or the Islamic State and then in July of 2017 the rest of Mosul was also liberated from the clutches of these people. Now these people obviously have caused a great deal of damage to Islam and the image of Muslims by their barbaric practices and it is also well established that their ranks were full of uh, CIA and Mossad agents perpetrating these horrible crimes. But unfortunately, many naive Muslims also fell for their rhetoric and they have ruined their own lives as well as the lives of uh, millions of other Muslims around the world. Now the other uh, misadventures that Muhammad bin Salman got into, the first in Yemen, which is his personal baby because he has is the defense minister of Saudi Arabia and the decision with respect to war is made by him. And when he attacked Yemen in March of 2015, it was assumed that Yemen would collapse in a matter of days, if not sooner. Now, as of today, as we speak on this program, the war in Yemen is continuing, although uh, it has been bombed into smithereens Thousands of people have been killed in Yemen. Much of Yemen's infrastructure has been destroyed. And because of a tight siege that the Saudis and their allies have imposed on Yemen, there is now a cholera epidemic in Yemen that has affected more than half a million people, the vast majority of them children. The United Nations has in fact said that Saudi Arabia may be guilty of war crimes in Yemen. And a time perhaps may uh, arrive when Saudi rulers may be hauled before the International Criminal Court to face charges of war crimes. Now the most recent uh, problem that the Saudis inherited for themselves was with Qatar. Uh, in, on June the 5th of 2017, all of a sudden Saudi Arabia together with three or four of its allies decided that they were going to uh, cut off diplomatic relations against Qatar they're going to cut off all trade links with them. They're going to prevent Qatar Airways from using their airspace and so on. And what was the reason? The Saudis alleged that the Qataris are supporting terrorism. Well, this allegation is true. The Qataris are supporting terrorism, 
but so are the Saudis. In fact, Saudi Arabia is a factory of terrorists. Their own scholars, clerics have admitted that their textbooks are the ones that are being used by the takfiri terrorists to continue their barbaric practices, distorting the image and message of Islam. So we see that on the international level, whatever the Saudis have done, particularly under the kingship of Salman, and more particularly because Salman is uh, demented, he is hardly able to uh, understand what is going on around him, and Saudi policy is essentially uh, formulated and managed by his erratic son, Mohammed bin Salman, that it's Mohammed bin Salman who is responsible for all of these policy failures. Now, in Qatar, uh, it was again assumed that Qatar would be on its knees very soon and that, uh, and that they would come begging to the Saudis to be forgiven. Instead, the Qataris have managed to stand their ground primarily because they made uh, very uh, good, uh, sensible policies with respect to establishing cordial relations with Turkey and the Islamic Republic of Iran. And therefore, they have been able to withstand the boycott and the siege that the Saudis imposed. Besides, this, the Qataris have an enormous uh, uh, sovereign fund, something like $350 billion. And for a small country like Qatar with a total population of about 2 million people, that's a lot of wealth. And that wealth has been wisely invested all around the world. So in fact, the Qataris have done very well for themselves and they are able to withstand the Saudi pressure that they were trying to exert on them. And so there is another policy failure that Saudi Arabia has encountered. Now, the other thing that Saudi Arabia is known for is its enormous wealth. There is no doubt that Saudi Arabia has a lot of wealth, uh, but that is all based on the sale of oil. Saudi Arabia is naturally the largest producer of oil in the world. It has something like $750 billion in reserves that are stashed away in U.S. Treasury bonds. Now, one would think that Saudi Arabia with such wealth would be an island of prosperity, but that would be a wrong assumption. Outside the glitzy malls in major cities, there is mass poverty in Saudi Arabia. Saudi economists themselves have admitted that 50% of the Saudi population lives below the poverty line. Second, 48% of Saudis do not own their homes. This was even, in fact, reported by Vanity Fair, who sent their reporters to Saudi Arabia to find out what the reality of the desert kingdom was. Now, Saudi Arabia's population is uh, about 28 million, out of which 70% are below the age of 25. Now, most of these people, young people, are unemployed. They have few opportunities for employment, and therefore, resentment against the regime is uh, increasing principally because uh, until the decline in the price of oil, the Saudi regime was able to buy the loyalty of the people. But now that wealth is no longer available. Number one, because of the decline in the price of oil, the Saudi regime has been running budget deficits, running, running into at least $100 billion each year since the year 2014. Now, that would still be considered small potatoes for a country like Saudi Arabia, but for the fact that the $750 billion that the Saudis have in reserves are simply not available to them. How so? Well, what has happened is that in 2016, the U.S. Congress passed a law whereby it said that the victims of 9-11 or their family members can sue Saudi Arabia for damages alleging that 15 of the 19 hijackers uh, on the planes uh, in 9-11 uh, attacks were Saudi citizens. So a case has been launched in court in the United States, thereby freezing Saudi assets. Although damages only worth about $100 billion are sought, but the fact is that all of the money that Saudi Arabia has put in deposits in the United States is currently frozen 
and therefore inaccessible to the Saudi regime. In fact, the Saudi regime is so desperate now that they have gone to the International Monetary Fund, cap in hand, asking for $10 billion in loan. This would have been unthinkable only a few years ago. Now, those familiar with the machinations and mechanisms of the International Monetary Fund would know what would ensue. The Monetary Fund, in fact, imposes structural adjustment programs. It insists that subsidies must be withdrawn and that uh, people must pay taxes. Now, hitherto, Saudi citizens have not pay, paid any taxes. In fact, uh, when uh, last year, uh, Mohammed bin Salman announced that he was going to withdraw subsidies and bonuses from civil servants and others, there was, in fact, an uproar on the social media. And then in April of 2017, he was forced to withdraw that decree or that order, and so the bonuses, etc., will continue to flow to the people. There are, of course, other subsidies that have been withdrawn, subsidies on electricity, on fuel, and so on, that is also leading to resentment among the people. Now, Mohammed bin Salman is uh, given to uh, issuing grandiose statements. For instance, he issued a new policy that is called Vision 2030. Now, under this, uh, it's a very uh, good sounding uh, vision to have, but uh, unfortunately, this vision is not going to be realized because the contours of the plan are very blurred. Uh, first of all, uh, he under this plan, he envisions that by the year 2020, the private sector is going to produce a million extra jobs. Number two, that Saudi Arabia is going to wean itself away from uh, addiction to oil. But what else is it going to do? Now, all the evidence indicates that so far, uh, the private sector is simply incapable of producing a million jobs because Saudi uh, personnel are simply not trained to do the work that they have been uh, getting other people, people from uh, other parts of the world, from Pakistan, from India, from Bangladesh, from Indonesia and the Philippines, etc., to do for them. In fact, the Saudis are so incompetent that many of them do not even know how to change a light bulb. There are, uh, you know, jokes galore about the Saudis' incompetence. We need not go into them, but the fact is that uh, Mohammed bin Salman's vision 2030 is unlikely to be realized. And that all the great plans that he is uh, planning with all this uh, and, and launching with such uh, fanfare are not likely to get very far. Now, if the Saudis are unable to provide employment for the youth, if they are unable, and we are talking about the rulers of Saudi Arabia, and as we mentioned, there is mass poverty over there, that this is going to lead to further resentment among the people. That's one aspect of uh, the kingdom's problems. They have, they have, they have had massive failures uh, at the level of foreign policy. They have had massive failures in the economic arena. And now there are troubles brewing inside the kingdom because there is a battle of succession going on. Now, political transitions are never easy affairs. They are always quite problematic. And they become even more problematic in a place or kingdom like Saudi Arabia where there are no uh, formal structured institutions that would facilitate such political transition. Now, according to Saudi constitution and tradition, uh, the next uh, brother in line to Salman should actually take over as king when he dies, but Salman has changed the rules. He has appointed his own son, Muhammad bin Salman, as crown prince. So Muhammad bin Salman is now not only the crown prince, he is defense minister, he is in charge of the, the kingdom's economic policy as well as security. When it was announced in June of 2017 
that Muhammad bin Salman had been appointed crown prince. Uh, this was actually done by first dismissing Muhammad bin Naif, uh, who was the former crown prince, from his position. And then Muhammad bin Naif was put under house arrest. So now we have a situation whereby there are two at least known members of the royal family that are under house arrest, uh, Muhammad bin Naif as well as Abdul Aziz ibn Fahad. And there are some Saudi royals that have uh, fled to Europe, particularly to Britain, where they have been publishing reports in the British media talking about the troubles that the ruling family is facing. Now, the rumors coming out of Saudi Arabia say that uh, King Salman wishes to appoint his son, Muhammad bin Salman, as king before Salman dies. Now, it's quite possible, but there are certain uh, hurdles in the way of this plan. The main one is that uh, there are other members of the royal family that are far more senior to Muhammad bin Salman and that are far more experienced than Muhammad bin Salman that would not uh, accede to this development. We need to go into a little bit of uh, background in order to understand exactly uh, why this would be the case. In January of 2015, when King, King Abdullah was on his deathbed, uh, he was in fact in a coma. Now at that time, Ali Tawajri, who was the court secretary and had been a court secretary for a number of uh, Saudi kings, uh, he and uh, Mut'ib bin Abdullah, who is the son of uh, King Abdullah, and Mut'ib of course at that time was and still continues to be the head of the National Guard, they actually conspired to forge King Abdullah's signatures, removing Salman from the position of crown prince. At that time, of course, Salman was the crown prince as well as the governor of um, Riyadh, the capital of Saudi Arabia. And yet, um, they were unsuccessful because this plot was uncovered by Salman and his son, Muhammad bin Salman. So, if you Immediately after Abdullah died, um, one of the first acts of uh, King Salman was to dismiss Ali Tawajri as court secretary. Now, of course, uh, Mut'ib bin Abdullah is a very powerful figure because the National Guard are based on uh, tribal allegiances. And because uh, Abdullah, who was the, the crown prince for many years and prior to that he was the head of the National Guard, he had cultivated very close links with all the tribes in Saudi Arabia. And so had Mut'ib, and Mut'ib has a lot of support among these tribes. So if uh, Muhammad bin Salman or King Salman try to remove Mut'ib from his position as head of the National Guard, there are going to be problems. In fact, even if they are successful in removing him, and even if King Salman is able to appoint his own son, Muhammad bin Salman, as king of Saudi Arabia, what is likely to happen is that after Salman dies, that the other princes are not going to take this situation lying down. They feel that Muhammad bin Salman has messed up things so badly externally in his foreign relations, internally in terms of the economy, again externally in terms of the war on Yemen that has gone very badly, and they feel that there is likely to be serious repercussions for the kingdom. And so the other princes are likely to perhaps get together and get rid of Muhammad bin Salman even if he becomes king. Now there is precedent for that in the, in the Saudi kingdom. Back in 1964, Muhammad bin uh, Saud, uh, was removed as king because uh, although he was the uh, eldest uh, son of Abdul Aziz ibn Saud, but because of his erratic behavior, he was dethroned and exiled and uh, Faisal, who was the crown prince at the time, took over as king of Saudi Arabia. So there is precedent for removing a sitting king in the kingdom. And in this particular situation, it is even more problematic or complicated for Muhammad bin Salman because there do exist senior princes to him, including many sons of Abdul Aziz ibn Saud, uh, who do not wish to see an upstart 
and an incompetent one at that running this kingdom. Although uh, on anybody who visits uh, Saudi Arabia can see that there are huge billboards all over the place with King Salman and Muhammad bin Salman looking into the sky and talking about the future of the bright future of the kingdom. But in fact, they are driving that kingdom into the ground. Now, Muhammad bin Salman prides on the fact that he has very good relations with U.S. President Donald Trump. That may be the case at a personal level, but he has not been able to extract the $750 billion of Saudi wealth that has been frozen in America. Further, there are in fact some uh, reports and some indication that the kingdom might even split up. After all, it is involved in a brutal suppression campaign against their own population in the eastern province of Saudi Arabia, which is the oil producing area. Uh, the, these Saudis come from Najat. And then the sacred cities of Makkah and al Madina that, uh, that are in the Hejaz. In fact, there is a growing movement around the world demanding that the Hejaz be taken out of the control of this family because it is corrupt, it is dishonest, they are morally bankrupt, and they have ruined everything that they have touched. In fact, a clear example of this is the destruction that they have wrought on Makkah and al Madina and destroyed the sacred sites in these two holy cities and replaced them with concrete and steel uh, monstrosities the worst of which is that satanic clock tower that dwarfs uh, the Kaaba, the sacred house of Allah. So as we proceed further, it is highly likely that the Saudi kingdom is going to hit even more turbulence and that there are going to be major shakeups within the kingdom, particularly in the ruling family. And in fact, if the ruling family is overthrown, the sooner the better because then Muslims can begin to order their lives according to the pristine principles of Islam. So it seems that Saudi Arabia is heading for very, very difficult times, particularly with this erratic prince in, in control, uh, who is uh, incompetent, who has not managed to improve the lives of his people, and because uh, the, the oil prices remain low and the kingdom's income continues to uh, decline, and he continues to wage these uh, destructive wars. In fact, it's estimated that uh, the Saudi regime is uh, spending something like $6 billion a month on the war in Iraq. And they tried to rope in uh, the Pakistan army through what was referred to as the Islamic uh, force or Islamic army of 34 Muslim nation states. But there is no army of that nature. Although the former Pakistani uh, chief of the armed forces or chief of the army, General Raheel Sharif was appointed to head this army, but it's, there, there is no army as such. It's just a name that has been given to it. And this is another of the failures of Muhammad bin Salman that has ruined virtually everything that he touches uh, with his grubby hands. So it seems that the uh, Saudi kingdom or the kingdom under Bani Saud is really heading for trouble and very, very turbulent and difficult times. I'm afraid that's all the time we have for today. You have been watching Muslim Perspectives from me, Zafar Bangash, and our team at Muslim Perspectives. Thank you for watching. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The noble messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is revered and loved by all Muslims but there is one aspect of his blessed life that is not well known and that is the treaties he entered into as well as the letters he wrote to kings and rulers of neighboring countries. For the first time this book, Power Manifestations of the Sirah, examining the letters and treaties of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam discusses this crucial topic in detail. The book is now available at a special price of $30, including shipping and handling anywhere in North America. Order from Crescent International, P.O. Box 747, Gormley, Ontario, L0H1G0, or call us 905-887-8913. Order your copy today.